Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky in Little Rock, it's Shame Plays Geek Talk. Today, we're going to gather our party before venturing forth. It's a special episode, a very special episode of Shane Plays Geek Talk. Uh, got my buddy Matt Barton of Matt Chat, Professor Matt Barton, the King Rat himself on. I'll uh, get him talking with us here in a second. He's waiting eagerly in the wings. He's probably, Zach, you got, go ahead and play that. You got it? This is Matt Barton killing a rat accurate this thing is in terms of speed oh there we go <laughs> i knew it <laughs> oh we got a giant rat, got <laughs> a giant rat. Oh, matt's God. playing ultima man i love these and i got a mace perfect rat killing weapon on it thing the mace <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's all about. I mean, look at—he's begging for. He's got like these little claws that he's like, please hit me with the mace. But look, he's like an evil rat too. Oh it's yeah, just those eyes, man. And he, he almost killed me. <laughs> got him down to nine health points, and there's a dad blasted thief after me. God, that is—that's uh, just a mild example. Of my friend Matt Barton losing his mind over killing rats in a, in a CRPG, which is a computer role-playing game. Again, this is Shane Stacks. I'm your host. This is Shane Plays Geek Talk. Uh, the the, the uh, disembodied voice you heard chuckling in the background a moment ago is, is Matt Barton, my friend. Matt, what's going on, man? Get that mace! Yeah, get that mace! No, beady, beady little eyes looking at me. Oh, he's evil. Oh, he's evil. So, uh... Whiskers, ah! Yeah, so we've got something real cool to talk about here in a second, uh, an announcement that we've already announced, but we have a real announcement to make now. Uh, and then, because I don't want this to be an hour-long advertisement just for what we're going to announce, I thought it would be fun to have a discussion on, we're each going to give our top three computer role-playing games of all time. And then, uh, and for the, if you're listening, like, what is a computer role playing game? Because I have people of different fandoms and geekdoms and people stumbling across the radio dial that hear this show. It is a, it is a role playing game that you play on a computer or video con video game console. Yeah, if you don't know, maybe you should pres preserve their innocence. Well, it, it's too late. <laughs> the, just like you love to kill a rat, I love to introduce people to to new geekdoms and fandoms and and stuff that I love and and of the pillars of my geekdom, uh, computer role playing games is one of them. Uh, comic books would be another one. So uh, the, the these are we're we're right up in my main. Uh, so Freedom Force must have just been. That's got to be on your. That's got to be one of your favorites. Well, we'll just have to see. So <laughs> we've got to hold our powder, pal. Uh, yeah, I got a tease. Let's call the tease. Will Freedom Force uh, be on my list? I know what's going to be on Matt's, or at least I have a. I have a pretty good guess. Uh, but on top of that, we're also going to share the uh, the upcoming. CRPG that's not released yet that we're most anticipating. And then if we have time, we're going to share our personal biggest disappointment in computer role playing games, period. So, uh, so that's, that's going to be the show. But before we get to all that, I got, I got to throw out a couple of show notes here. If you're listening on May 4th, no, May, May 11th, today's the 11th. Last week was May 4th. Uh, on, on May 11th at 1 p.m. Central, on 101.1 FM The Answer or via the live stream at 101.1 FM The Answer dot com. So glad to have you. Uh, that's that's the live show. So we're live right now if you're listening at that time. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could tweet me at Shane Plays S H A N E P L A Y S. Uh, or you could you could if you if you if you if you got any cojones. You could call in at 501 
So anyway, uh, this is a live show if you're listening on May 11th at 1 p.m. Central. Uh, if you're listening by podcast uh, or on YouTube or on Krypton Radio, kryptonradio.com is sci-fi for your Wi-Fi. We always play a week delayed there. Uh, just, just really glad to have you along for the ride. Uh, last week's show, which was live from Sponsor Collector's Edition in uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas, it was free comic book day. And we did, uh, we had a, uh, we reassembled the, the same team we had a year ago uh, of Michael Brown, Richard McBain, and William McBean, McBean, McBain and uh, talked about uh, uh, Avengers Endgame while we were also having a live event, including a cosplay contest at Collector's Edition. So that's archived out there as the podcast and everything, if you want to go look for that. Uh, today's show, again, is we have a big product announcement and then um, we're going to be talking about computer role playing games. So, I, I mean, um, Matt, this is your baby. I, I helped, but this is your baby. So, what, what are we holding in our eager little hands that officially releases tomorrow? Let's see, big project released tomorrow. What could that I be? Don't know, Shane. My once a year toothbrushing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well. What could it possibly? Should I just should I just blurt it out? Just throw it out there, man. <laughs> Drum roll. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. We have Dungeons and Desktops 2.0. Whoa. Second edition, bigger, better, and most importantly, in color. With more rats. More rats <laughs> in color, guaranteed. Yeah, than... I did 200 extra pages on that. Yeah, it's this book. Um, I, I want to go ahead and talk about this Way book. More rats. It's that's an important point. We should emphasize. That. Yeah, there know. are literally when I was okay. looking for screenshots in this book, I made sure if they had a rat in them that that rat had some action, and then it was like Black l- rats, leaping rats, at the screen. Giant rats, yeah. barbecue rats. So again, if you don't know what a computer role playing game is, um, modern examples would be Skyrim, uh, Fallout Four. Uh, uh, you know, there's there's other stuff out there. Uh, Diablo, so people would argue. Divinity, original sin. Divinity, uh, but the the stuff that's really gotten out there that even the most casual gamer or person probably knows is is probably Skyrim or Fallout, and and those games came from a genre that has Witcher. a vi- what, what was that? Witcher. The Witcher, perfect example. Yes, The Witcher uh, for, is, is part of a genre of games that has a long, rich history going back to the 70s. Uh, you know, mostly when, 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 uh, when the chocolate accidentally fell in the peanut butter and then you got Reese's. Well, uh, when, when D&D oh, that's, that's when, when D&D accidentally fell into the mainframe on college campuses... CR and I'm I'm oversimplifying, but basically the the computer role playing game was born, uh, and it, and it came out of stuff even before that war gaming and stratomatics, you know, fantasy baseball game and and all that stuff. But uh, but anyway, so that you know, so if you you know Baldur's Gate, uh, trying to think of some other you know Divinity, uh, Original Sin, uh, there, there, there's a oh, ton of role playing game. Say that again. Ultima. Ultima. Yeah, Ultima. So. Uh, all of these Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate which uh, Baldur's Gate 2 will be Matt's biggest disappointment. That's that that made his biggest disappointment list. So oh, yeah, we don't talk. We don't use that name. Yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't talk about that. Oh. So, Zach, do you play any computer role playing games? I do not. You don't. I don't. I just love watching them on YouTube. But you watch them on YouTube. You know, I don't play video games really as much as I used to. So I just basically watch. You yeah. know, and this. I mean, I just enjoy it. Yeah. So what um That's a thing now. There's it's a huge thing. Game. What uh, Might and Magic, there's another big one. Um what oh, yeah. what John uh, Van Kenningham. What what can you think of a computer role playing game that you like to watch? Well you brought up The Witcher. The Witcher. And I also big. love the um um is it the Telltale games with the um was it the Wolf Among Us and games like that? Now those are those I would I would classify those as adventure games or okay. choose your own adventure games okay. uh I, and i i'm not going to go down this rabbit hole yeah. because uh it's Both real must define yeah terms. it is really it's it's a big debate on what a role-playing game is okay uh but the uh the telltale games mm-hmm. 
or are usually uh, you follow a plot and you're presented with a one of two choices, right? And then you choose, and then a different. So role playing games usually, at a minimum, involve some sort of character that their skills increase gotcha. or something they get experience okay. or something, and then uh, it, you know, so that's that's one of the basic. And I don't think that happens in the Traveler's no, Tales, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. but the storytelling aspects of role playing games are strong, and those Traveler's Tales games have extremely strong storytelling aspects yeah. well the witcher like i say i love the yeah. witcher 3 yeah. well the witcher is a great example mm-hmm. of a role-playing game that also has a very strong storytelling and cinematic yeah. experience mm-hmm. to it so anyway okay so we're uh w- matt and i are ridiculously pleased to announce that uh it, matt wrote a book about 10 years ago called dungeons and desktops the history of computer role-playing games and it's considered one of them, like anybody who's into, and it took over the planet, and it did. It ate the planet. Uh, we're sure. living. We're actually living inside the book right now, and we just don't realize it. Um, oh. And it's uh, it's it's considered anybody that like teaches video game history or is a hobbyist of video game history, retro gaming, especially computer role playing games. Uh, which this is a, a fascinating. Um, uh, thing for me because I love tabletop role playing games, and I love uh, computer games. So to watch these two to come together and to learn the history of how it all happened and and who innovated what is just fascinating. But this is a uh, a new book. It's an updated version of Matt's book from ten years ago. Uh, and and again, anybody that's like really hardcore into the history of uh, computer role playing games specifically, but retro gamings in general is probably aware of Matt's book. Uh, the, within that that niche, it's a very important book, and, and it's also important pop culturally because it's uh, what, it, what Matt does with his Matt Chat YouTube series uh, wh- where he plays games and talks about them, and then he in- interviews game developers. Uh, it, it, I mean, he's, he's getting documented uh, for, for future, you know, historians or whatever uh, uh, stuff that's going to be very important when people try to understand uh, pop culture and pop culture is the rat slayers being swaddled right now. Yeah. You know, I did have to restrain Matt from dedicating 96.3% of the book to his exploits of killing rats. So (laughs) that's one of the few things I was able to keep him from doing. But again, uh, this book is very important. Dungeons and desktops, the history of computer role playing games. And, and about a year ago, Matt and I were talking, and uh, we're like, let's update this book to a new edition. Because the original edition, as important as it is, and, and a lot of people love that book and it have had copies some of it. Issues. What's that? It, you know, it's, it, it was. Had a, some issues. Yeah. And the main thing that this book, right off the bat, anybody flipping through it is going to see that every screenshot in here. Is bold, Gorgeous. delicious, vivid color. Crisp. Yep. These screenshots just pop off the page. Just pops off the page and pokes you in the eye. Just pokes you right in the eye. I've, I've, yeah, yeah. It hurts. I've gone through three eyes just since I started looking at this book. <laughs> I'm running low. Looking for the brightness dial. Yeah. The contrast. It, it looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's got the existing content that was already in the book has been revised in some cases uh corrected there you know maybe uh, uh there were typos or you know they're just Coupled. all all of the issues with the first edition uh that we know of have been corrected uh there are beautiful i mean just absolutely beautiful uh sizzling hot spanking sweet color screenshots photos of me there's a picture somewhere a in the book of, of matt with a hat on Matt with a hat on. Yeah, you're reenacting oh, the uh, the first scene of the Bard's Tale. Yeah, yes. Oh yeah. Back in my Bardly days. Yeah, back in your Bard days, and then uh, it's got uh, here uh, the key features according to the back of the book. Uh, reviews and commentary on hundreds of games across many platforms. Comprehensive coverage of the history of computer RPGs. Uh, hundreds of full color screenshots, images, and photos, and a comprehensive index at the back. Uh, in yes, addition to that, index. Matt, yes, there's an index, which makes me happy. Index. 
an index. Yes. Uh, it's a good index, too. It, it's really good. Did you do the index? the index? I didn't touch the index. Did you do the index? Well, I did not do the index. Who did the index? <laughs> Whoever did it did a good job. I think I might have uh, suggested a few entries, but that's a good question. I don't know. Who, who did the index? I, I didn't do the know. index. It just kind of magically appeared. I uh, know you didn't do it. I didn't do it. No, I did not do the index. I would have probably jumped off my roof halfway index. through. And that, you know, kind of laughing at that, but that's a pretty big deal when you're looking for a game, mm-hmm. designer, or concept, mechanic, whatever. Yeah, it absolutely is. And then I just don't think indexers get enough love. I mean, here we are. We don't even know the name of our indexer. I don't know. Whoever you are, you phantom indexer. You I'm have my indexer. You have my unwavering uh, admiration. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the book later in the show. Uh, but the uh, the Matt also added uh, this thing, an appendix called the CRPG um, Bestiary. So there's a ton of CRPGs in here that he gave like a paragraph kind of write up to, like a lot of those like Leonard Maltin um, yeah. like movie reference books where you just get like a little paragraph on the movie, kind of you know tell you summarizes it. Uh, for, yeah. So for the, the games that, that couldn't be got to in the main part of the book, and the book is split into chapters that progresses across the history of role playing games or computer role playing games. And at the very beginning, it's talking about role playing games and war gaming and all that. This isn't just an encyclopedia of video game entries. This is uh, a, a comprehensive walk through of the history of computer role playing games. And each chapter also has entries on standout games from that era, uh, whether they stood out because they were good or because they were turkeys. Uh, but, but you know, they're in there. Uh, and then there's, there's new content, you know, because you can't, then the past 10, what happened in the past 10 years, Matt? Oh, what was this website that came along that did big things? What now? There was, there was a website <laughs> that came along that allowed people to do big things. Well, I know you're not talking about matchat.us. You must be talking about Kickstarter. Kickstarter, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we have an entire section of the book called the Kickstarter Renaissance. Crowd funding. Yes, or, 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 or the Renaissance comic Kickstarted. And so that's a major addition to this book, too. Renaissance. Renaissance. How do you pronounce that word, anyway? I say Renaissance, but I could, I'm sure I could be wrong. Well, how do you say it? Renaissance? Renaissance. Renaissance. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so um, this this book, we'll talk a little bit more about this book uh, later in the show, but you can get it on Amazon right now. There'll be links in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast version, uh, but it's Dungeons and Desktops, the History of Computer Role-Playing Games, second edition. You can go to Amazon and order it, uh, and that's in soft cover. And then, and, and I believe there's a hardcover version that you order directly through CRC Press, which is the publisher. Is that, is that correct, Matt? You get the hardcover from Amazon too. Oh, can you? Okay. It's about. I think it's even. Yeah, I think it's on Amazon and the publisher's website. Okay. As far as I know, they're both the same price at the moment. Oh, nice. So, uh, okay. I mean, they've never seen the soft cover and the hard cover, but yeah, Amazon or the publisher site, <laughs> the same deal. Right, and we've got this book has a uh, forward from Chris Avalone. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, backward by you. Yeah, it's got a backward by me. A surprise encounter. Uh, and then it, and, and, and just a couple of the people who were kind enough to give us uh, quotes include Richard Garriott, Lord British himself, and Brian Fargo. So, uh, you know, it's fantastic. Um, big, big names. Big, big, big names. Big names. This is, uh, and and when, the, when this book came in and we got it in our hands on, was it Thursday we, we each got our copies? I was, man, I was knocked over. Yeah, you had to wait for yours, really. Yeah, I found out about two o'clock in the afternoon. Mine were in a box, sitting on the porch, and I didn't get home till like about nine o'clock that night. So that was kind of hard. Um, and you opened up the box, and it was like the pulp tin moment with a glow. Oh yeah, it was amazing. So my my inner thirteen year old is finally impressed with me. Finally, after all these years. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now on Amazon. Are you? You're ordering a copy right now on Amazon, Zach. <laughs> You're ordering 10 copies? How many copies can you order at once? I know. Thanks, Zach. You're expensing it to the radio station's account? <laughs> to your account. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. You want to give him a free copy? Come on. Oh, yeah, he'll get a copy. Are you kidding? Zach's getting a copy. He'll poke and prod it with a stick because it's a physical thing and not digital, but I'm still going to give him a copy. Are you 
you get him a digital copy. It is all available on Kindle, right? Yeah. Zachary, it, there, I guess if he's looking at the site, can you let us know if there's a Kindle version? It is on Kindle. It I is on it Kindle. Day, but, but I do prefer on. the physical copy. All right. Well, I do. Man, he is pulling out his credit card like a ninja. He's holding it like a throwing oh. star. Yeah. So, he's ready to level up. Oh, yeah. So we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about this book. Uh, later, but it's Dungeons and Desktops, the 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 history of computer role playing games, second edition. Uh, again, I, I know that I'm one of the co-authors, and Matt, thank you again for allowing me to to participate in the ride because it was it was a heck of a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that special sauce, the old special sauce, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you'd be surprised how much funnier this edition is too. We didn't even mention that. Yeah, yeah, we tried to work in some personality and you Very know and. I've gotten, I've already, geeky. I've already gotten feedback on that, 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 that people like that, you know, and I didn't <laughs> know, like, I didn't know how it was going to go down. You know, I was like, ah, it seems funny now, but I, I think it, I think it worked out. And I thought the publisher might pull it, but they didn't. Cause we have these little Abbott and Costello routine going through the whole book or parts of the book. Anyway, I want to make sure to give credit to the cover artist, Robbie Sam Watt. This was an acrylic painting that took him about four months, and it is an homage to the original Pool of Radiance cover art, and it, and it shows uh, Matt Barton, the Rat King himself, holding a, a sword like a total Viking and uh, surrounded by rats and, and all that cool stuff. It's a fantastic cover, uh, so thank you again, Robbie. But anyway, to move us forward, because uh, I do want to make sure we're going to give our countdown on on our computer role playing games uh which is why you know some people will be listening to the show just for that uh, but if you buy a copy of the book i sure would appreciate it um and i've got to do this uh it's very important there are people out there that that have that they just put up with me so they can get to the banter segment with zach so so zach how the heck are you buddy i'm doing fantastic all right well as far as i know everything is is quiet on the muffin front. Mm-hmm. People don't know that the head of my news team, Sal, and uh, it's not him, but it's his grandmother and her dog Muffin. Mm-hmm. If I don't banter with Zach, they get upset. So, uh, so did we, you know, but I like bantering with Zach, right? Mm-hmm. Zach, we're buddies, so you know it, it's a win for everybody. So go ahead and uh, let's do our our weekly Survivor Westeros check. <laughs> Okay, Zach, we're in the final season of Game of Thrones. Yes, we are. Which we're calling Survivor Westeros. Mm-hmm. I don't watch it, but you do. I do. So I, I depend on you, Zach, okay. uh, and, and others depend on you. Now, now, Matt, do you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's you got it back up here. Okay. okay. So the last time we did this, there were four people in the studio, and like nobody watched Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But Zach did. So... Uh, Zach, what happened? Yeah, Zach. This past weekend, basically, it was the follow-up episode after the major war. What which, were they? The the episode where they shoved all the women and children down in a crypt it, while undead were attacking. It, yes, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so the episode <laughs> after that, what happened? So, like, so this was the, this was the episode after, and basically, it was just them recuperating, you know, getting ready for their fight against Cersei, you know, who's the quote unquote queen of the seven kingdoms she's and that's cersei lannister cersei right? lannister right. you know what she may say she's the queen but she may not actually be the queen but that's for another day or whatever so like i said they're recuperating getting their minds back in order you know and um just seeing who all they have if they need to rest you do, know do they have any women or children left after putting them in <laughs> with a bunch of corpses during an undead attack there's still some left there's some still, some Okay, it should be still some left, but I, yeah, it was a bad decision. Yeah, okay. it was a bad decision. I didn't. Even, I mean, I'm like, well, that's just stupid. Well, you know what? This season has actually been, you know, criticized for that exact same reason. There's been a lot of bad decisions. It's like, what know? are y'all doing? What are you doing? Yeah, you know. And so, but you know, that was the follow up episode after the major war. Well, now you had the red wedding, right? Yes. Are they calling the crypt scene the black funeral? <sighs> Matt, what do you think? How, what, <laughs> Matt, what did Star, you think the of the Starbucks moment? Right? Yeah, 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 we're going to get into Starbucks. Mm-hmm. I got that, but <laughs> but what did, what did you think of the tactical or strategic or whatever it is decision to put all the women and children in a crypt during an undead fight? <laughs> Would you do it in a computer uh, role playing game if it was one of the options? I mean, I, That's a great question. 
So, Matt, you're playing, uh, let's say, that in Baldur's Gate 2. Maybe you don't like the women and children all that much. You know, have you thought about that? Well, I mean, but, I mean, it's possible. A good <laughs> a good computer role-playing game will give you, uh, you know, variations of choice and, and moral ambi- amb- uh, ambiguity. Yeah, that would have been a reload moment. That would have been, you would have to, re- so, but, I, like. I want to reload it. Yeah. Like, okay, what's the. <laughs> let's say, let's say that you were playing a computer role-playing game. Uh, Ultima, let's call it Ultima, no, or oh, Baldur's yeah, Gate, whatever. Yeah, All right, Pull of Radiance, whatever. And they're like, we're about to be attacked by a bunch of undead, and they and they say, sir, what should we do with all the women and children? And the choices that pop up say, give them weapons and let them defend themselves. B, send them away to Helm's Deep, or C, put them in a crypt with a bunch of bodies. Uh, I mean, do, wh- wh- which way would you go with that? <laughs> you need to watch the show, Shane. You need to watch it. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, any kind of Total War kind of game would yeah. taught you. You probably don't want to charge your cavalry in like that first thing either, you know? Yeah, you got. You know, it's, you know, I don't know. Anyway. Well, I've seen some breakdowns where people are like, I don't, I don't know, I guess they think they're generals or something. I don't know. I, I'm no general, but I don't think. You know? I mean, I wouldn't put my wife and child in with a corpse during an undead attack. You're That's just basically saying it should be common sense. Might as well, right. let's, let's send them away. You right. know? Let's just send them I away. I mean, I get the point of like put them in like the basement because it's like the crypts. Put them down there. I get that. Well, guess what, guys? There's already stuff down there. <laughs> and it's an undead attack in a fantasy world. I would love well, watching the episode with you. People in this world that don't believe that. You know, all this is happening, right? They still think the walkers and everything's still a myth. All right. Well, you can't. I mean, all you got to do is look at the past two or three election cycles. We're no better in real life, right? We we we, we only believe what we want to believe. And that's as political as I get. I'm going to reel it back in. All right, the Starbucks moment, since, since Matt brought it up. Matt, what happened with the Starbucks moment? You know, I didn't even see the Starbucks cups. Apparently, they've already edited, edited it out. But yes, I guess it was, uh, Zachary might know more about it, but it seemed like they just kind of messed up. And I guess one of the actors was drinking out of a Starbucks cup, had it on the table. Yeah, I missed it myself. It was kind of a big moment. Yeah, it was. I mean, like I said, I just saw it on Twitter probably like a day or two later, and I missed it. You know, I had no idea about it. So was it like, is is like Starbucks running like a viral ad campaign? Like, hey, are you dragon? <laughs> Come on in and get a cup. I mean, is that, I would. That's a great one. I heard something that, like, literally, yeah, they like, were honestly she like... Wanna, she wouldn't get coffee from Starbucks. I mean, she's obviously a caribou coffee type of queen, you know? Right. So, anyway, I saw, like, the, <laughs> the thing going around on, you know, Twitter or whatever, and I thought somebody just Photoshopped it in there, and, just, and I was like, there's some obscure joke I'm not getting, and then comes out, you know, find out that, 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 that there it is. So, uh there you go. The mighty, the cup of... Yeah, I thought it had been photoshopped in or it was just some little object that kind of looked like a Starbucks cup. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of blurry, you know? It's a new magical item called the Cup of Stars. The Flagon of it's Stars. Cup of stars. Yeah. All right. So, anyway. Well, Zach, thanks so much for the check-in, pal. So, all right, Matt, let's do this before we go to a break. Uh, let's give out our, our third... We're going to count down our top three CRPGs of all time <laughs> to celebrate CRPG countdown. To, 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 to count up, I, guess. I like to that. Yeah, up. give me some more of that '80s radio, Casey. I'd like to dedicate this top three I'm not to Matt Barton. What, Matt? What is your number three? Not your number one. Your number three, and why? Oh, this is hard, hard, hard. hard and this hard. this countdown is brought to you by. Dungeons and Desktop, second edition Dungeons from CRC Press, Desktop. available on Amazon. And Starbucks coffee. Co authors, yeah. Co- and uh, Star Wars coffee. <laughs> and Star Wars coffee, get it. And stupid I mean, tactical it, decisions yeah. in a big battle. And the letter Z. All right. For okay. The third position. Yep. I'm going to go Might and Magic 6 on that. There you go. Solid choice. Now, why are you going with that? It's just, it's one of those games that for me, it's kind of my comfort game yeah you know go back to it everything works it's just fun to play it's got that spirit the humor it's massive and you could play this thing for pretty much i think no i did spend pretty much whole summers playing yeah so how old were you when you were playing wonderful charming game the music just 
Good stuff. Good stuff. So how old were you when you first played Mind Magic 6? Well, let me see. I must have been like 20s, maybe. I remember I started to play it, and then some stuff happened, right? And then I didn't have uh, access to a computer anymore. All I had was an Amiga computer. <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't play that. I couldn't mm-hmm. play it on that. So I actually called Gateway. I remember back when that company. Oh, yeah. There for a while. Out. They were, I mean, yeah, everybody loved Gateway there for a while. I'm just like, send me a computer. So you demanded. Yeah, but it was well worth it, man. I just love that game. So, Fantastic. if you haven't played it, I think it still holds up really well today. I actually have never played Might Magic 6, but it's one of those games that's spoken the of always in massively, you know, uh, respectful tones. So, uh, and I have played some of the Might Magic. <clears throat> pardon me. I played Might Magic 10, which I enjoyed. Uh, but I've never, Might Magic is, was never uh, one of the. But the pale limitation change. Just, limitation. Well, I've, for. Might Magic, for whatever reason, I'm not against it. It's just never one of the series that I personally got into. So, uh, but I, I have played. I didn't get into the earlier ones. I played the first one a little bit on my Commodore 64, but uh, the six game. I remember I, I, one reason I got it too was just the awesome cover art. Mm. You know, I don't know the. It looks like a Clyde Caldwell. I'm not exactly sure who painted that. I did de- that classic Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, mm-hmm artistry Mm -hmm. with the dragon and the warriors and everything around it. I'm like, you know, I don't even know what kind (laughs) of, I haven't played any of these, but I can tell by the cover art. It's probably for me. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I miss the days of the big, huge boxes. And, you know, you and I have talked about this. You talk about a lot on your show. You you open up the box and then you get the, the cloth map and the little onk, you know, with Ultima or, uh, and then the manual and you just read the manual and you get all absorbed into it before you ever even load the game up. Uh, you know, well, which, yeah, that was the thing. I mean, people don't, I guess you still have install times, but you know, back then you might get four or five CDs mm-hmm. to install. I mean, that's going to take you at least an hour, maybe more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The whole time you could be looking through the manual, getting all psyched, pumped up. Oh yeah. Yeah, sometimes you had to read the manual first. You had to learn how to play the game before you before you dove in there. And then games like Pool of Radiance, of course, would have uh, journal entries you had to look up, you know, to because they didn't have memory enough memory to put it on the game. So I so, actually really liked that. I wish they would do that with some of these later games because you don't want to just, you know, especially like the uh, Skyrims and the Morrowinds, Oblivions. You don't have they have a lot of text that you're supposed to read. You know, not cutscenes, just like you pick up a book and right. put the text there on the screen. Yep. And something like that, I would I would like to have the option uh, where would you say turn to page twelve in the in the journal that came with the game. Right. right? Yeah. You could just read that, come back, play some more. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I I don't want to spend I, I guess I'm the, probably the only person that would like that, but uh, I I would like you know, it. I just don't like reading. I don't want to read a bunch of text on the screen if I can avoid. Right. Well, I mean, it's a different experience. There's there's a whole reflective versus transmissive, and whether it's easier on your eyes and all this stuff. But anyway, all right. So intrusive time. Moving us on. Uh, Matt's number three is Might and Magic Six. So there's there's the bump, mandate of heaven. Bump 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 bump. So all right. My number three is actually Freedom Force. So you were, you were, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, uh, the old yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it just scratched the old itch just right. I remember, uh, Wonderful game too. man, a lot, I can't remember what year that was early two thousands, late nineties. I can't remember. I was, uh, I was, at, I was actually driving home from being out with my buddies and the, and like the bar closed and uh i was at that time i was self employed so i was on my own hours and i was driving and i was bored i was like i'm not ready to go home yet so i, I rolled up into walmart good old 24 hour walmart and was just wandering around and i and this is you know it's it's a lot easier to be surprised by games today than it was or i mean it was easier to be surprised then than it is now you'd be like i never what is this game and I took it home and 
played it probably to about six o'clock in the morning. And it, it, for those of you who don't know, it's just a wonderful superhero RPG that's like a love letter to the comics of the '60s, like Jack oh, Kirby. Nailed it. Yeah, it was, it's wonderful. Uh, and and the and the the characters and the game itself was fun. But what bumped it in my number three slot is it also had um, this a really good community of modders that were uh, creating skins. So you could, you know, you could bring in your favorite superheroes and, and there were like uh, danger room scenarios and, and it was multiplayer. You could, you know, I, I spent probably 10 times more time creating my own characters and goofing around and running AI danger room type scenarios than I did actually playing the game or staying up all night playing it with a buddy and it, it was just a it was it's a great game so i i, de- I definitely have to get a lot of itches simultaneously. It, it's it's a wonderful game my only complaint like most computer role-playing games because i'm not a real time with pause guy is uh i i you know i wish somehow it could have been turn-based but it is what it is so uh all right so i'm going to get us to a break uh so we can get back and, and finish with our countdown here uh but first let me uh give some love to a sponsor So comic book lovers, head on over to Michael Tierney's local comic book stores for the newest books on the shelves, plus a fantastic selection of back issues. Visit the comic book store on Treasure Hill Road in Little Rock and Collector's Edition on JFK Boulevard in North Little Rock. And don't forget to click on over to thewildstars.com. Michael Tierney knows comics. In addition to being in business for nearly four decades and publishing his own comic book series, The Wild Stars, for almost as long and still going, he has written multiple columns for comics magazines and is an Overstreet Price Guide advisor. Michael is also the author of the wildly successful, high-quality, four-volume Labor of Love, the Edgar Rice Burroughs 100-Year Art Chronology. Remember... For all your comic book needs with friendly service, make sure to visit the comic book store on Treasure Hill Road in Little Rock, Collector's Edition on JFK Boulevard in North Little Rock, and thewildstars.com to learn more. Tell them Shane Place sent you. Last year, Game Goblins was proud to support Extra Life and Arkansas Children's Hospital with a $5,000 donation. This year, we've committed to giving a minimum of $10,000, and we're excited to invite our customers and gaming community to help make it happen. Beginning May 1st, whenever you make a purchase at Game Goblins, we'll ask a simple question. Would you like to round up for extra life in Arkansas Children's Hospital? If you do, we'll round your purchase to the nearest dollar, and those pennies will go to extra life. In addition, Game Goblins will match every customer's donation dollar for dollar up to $5,000. Together, we can have fun, play games, and help Arkansas Children's Hospital care for children in need. We hope you'll join us. The die is cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trollord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today located in little rock mustard seed moving offers the most reliable and most affordable moving services in the area with the widest variety of services including local moves moves across city or state lines office moving and home moving They'll move your house, your apartment, your office, piano, gun safe, copy machine, tanning bed, rotting lawn mower, and more. Mustard Seed Moving staff are highly qualified experts and professionals that have years of experience in the moving business, and every team member cares about their clients.
clients and providing them with the most excellent service available. Mustard Seed Moving knows the proper way to handle all your priceless and precious possessions from delicate to obscure or oversized so you can be sure your belongings are safe in their care. Contact Mustard Seed Moving 501-529-7171 to get your free quote or estimate today. Their operator is available around the clock for your convenience, so call 501-529-7171 for Mustard Seed Moving today. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk. This episode, in addition to our sponsors and Patreon supporters, dun dun dun, Dungeons and Desktops, the History of Computer Role-Playing Games 2nd Edition, which is an update of my friend Matt Barton. He just happens to be on the line with us on this show, if you're just now joining us. Press, Taylor uh, and Francis. Yes, yes, and it's an update uh, of, of his original book, which is well-respected, and it's it's got... More content, revised content. Uh, it covers the Kickstarter age from now. This to the XP, you know? Yeah, it is. It really is. Uh, and then it's uh, it's got an intro by Chris Avalone, the forward. Uh, it's got these beautiful crisp screenshots. Uh, it's just a heck of a heck of a great book if you're into video game history or uh, computer role playing games or or any of that. Uh, if if you were into if you like adventure, if you like if you like to gather your party and venture forth, then uh, you definitely need to check. And it covers. If you like fussing with your inventory. That's right. If you like to save scum. So um, anyway, if you I'd, like slaughtering rats in cellars and rats ah. and and Matt. Yeah, if you like to kill a rat in a cellar to get your first and XP. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? I mean, right? Whether they admit it or not. Who doesn't? So, uh, and like I said, it's updated. I, I'm a, I'm honored and pleased to be a uh, co-author on this book, and and you can get this book. I'm honored, at, please. Yeah, well, thank you, sir. Uh, and you can be, uh, you can find this on Amazon and uh, at the uh, publisher's website of CRC Press. Uh, so anyway, all right. So what we're doing is we're counting down our personal top three computer role playing games of all time. So Matt's number three was my not counting up, Shane. Well, no, because when you do, I mean, I, it can be argued either way. But in the common vernacular, <laughs> it's understood that when you're doing a countdown, that you're heading down to number one. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, so your number three was Might and Magic Six. My number three was Freedom Force. You know what? I'm, you know what? I'm, great games. I would, you know, any either one of those games. Great games. Great games. You want to know a dirty little secret? I own it, but I've never played Freedom Force versus the Third Reich. I have no idea how it compares to the original. Uh, I don't think it compares all that favorably. All right. I can't well. remember that one. Uh, no. I, I don't know. I loved Freedom Force, though. It's fantastic. I'm pretty sure I played through it. Yeah. The fact that I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good indication. <laughs> yeah, it's probably that, yeah. not the best time. But that first yeah. one, though, is a classic. Yeah. All right. So what's I your... I know people today that are just still... Livid that City of Heroes. Yeah, the big uh, MMO. MMO yeah, people, yeah, it's kind of the same, kind of a you know comic book MMO. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I know a lot of people that loved it. So what? What's your number two there, Matt? Well, I've got to do a number two. Yeah, you got to do a number two. You got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to put Pool of Radiance in that slot. Okay. Yeah. All right. Into why? Yeah, why? I mean, it's it's just it's kind of like oh, it wants to be number one, but uh, yeah. well, yeah, I, I know what your number play, one is yeah, now. Recently, yeah, having co-authored so, yeah. the book with you, I know what your number one is going to be now. <laughs> oh, do you? Oh yeah, I, I do. might change it just to mess with just you. to mess with me. All right. Um, well, uh, I mean, you are the gatekeeper of your list, so. Uh, you know, you can you can you can uh, monitor and adjust as as you see fit. So why yeah, super bombad racing an RPG? Su I don't yeah, know super bombad so. racing. If they ever do, if they ever do an RPG version of Star Wars super bombad racing, that's going to be my immediate number one. So, uh, but why? <laughs> for the benefit of the listeners, I know why you love Polar Radiance so much. But why do you love Polar Radiance? Oh God! What's the, what's not to love about Pool of Radiance? I mean, this is a game. It, to, to me, it was really the first time you had a really definitive Dungeons and Dragons experience on a computer. Right. You had the license, and it was Forgotten Realms. It was all it was all there. Thaco. <laughs> there. Turn based. 
It was turn based. Oh, he got a novel that went with it, you know. God, it's just magnificent. Right. So far, turn based. Yeah. I mean, you had battles in there that would last uh, hours. These epic battles. You know, just fun, fun. Big, massive map, a lot of diverse places to go. This was on a Commodore 64 for crying out loud. Yeah, Just, and uh, yeah, and wow. I I often wonder when I'm playing an emulated version of Pool of Radiance, is it which I enjoy, but I'm wondering, and because I've got a Commodore 64 now, uh, I wonder what it would be like if it would be even more immersive and more enjoyable to go back and play it on a Commodore 64. I bet it would. Uh, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> you got to wait for the thing to load and save games can get. Messed up. That's a true. Quick story about this pool radius game. Uh, my gra- I got it for I think it was either Christmas or my birthday. One of those. <laughs> uh, my grandmother bought it for me, uh, and she said I couldn't play it. I couldn't play it until you know the day. Right. I'm, I'm just going to go with birthday. You know, I said my birthday is like two weeks away. <laughs> and so I convinced her. I said, "Look, this is a I call her memo. This is a memo. This is a very." complicated game. You know, she let me open this up and read right. read the manuals. You know, I won't play the game. <laughs> let me read the manual. <laughs> uh, so I'll be ready. You know, ready hit the ground running on my birthday, right? Right. And so she agreed to that. So imagine my pain. You know, I must have read that manual about six times, Shane. <laughs> just Before, imagining. Yeah, just yeah, to imagine yeah, to to see what it would imagine be like. It. Yeah. I oh, love it. Well. All right. And the game did not disappoint. Well, it's a heck of a great game. Uh, a lot of people argue that it, even though you had Ultima and all these other games, that it it was really kind of kicked off a lot of what we understand. Well, it's, it's TSR. You know? Yeah, it was TSR. It's real deal. And, yeah, it's it's hard. To, I If anybody wants to experience, has never done, you know, you can go to GOG, uh, goodoldgames.com, get you a legit copy of it, check it out. Uh, it's you're basically playing AD and D second edition on a computer. So Pool of Radiance actually, for the most part, implements Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition rules, except for the fact that it uses Thaco to hit armor class zero for all of its attack uh, calculations and game mechanic, etc. And Thaco wasn't introduced universally as the main way of doing that in Dungeons & Dragons until Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. Uh, and, but just I will to, say the interface does not hold up as well. You know, there's a lot of... They really needed to... Uh, somebody needs to go in and update the UI, basically. Right. All right. Well, I got to move this forward. Yeah. We got about five minutes okay. left here. So, uh, but yeah, and, and, and I'm just going to go ahead and get... But we got seven minutes. Thanks, Zach. Oh, yeah. And Zach went and looked up. Freedom Force came out in 2002. But Pool of Radiance, I, I can't stress enough, not only how much fun of a game it is, really, especially considering the time that it was created, but how important it is like to the history idiot. of computer role-playing games. Um, a huge series, too. The Gold Box. Oh, yeah. Bunch of them. Yeah, you had, you know, uh, great stuff. So, uh, and, and guess what? My number two, Matt, uh, do you want you want to take a stab at what my number two is? Oh, you're number two. No, no, I'm number one, Matt. This is my show. You're calling? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, the the Fruit of Force is your third. What well, could be your second? Uh, it's radiant. It's a radiant game. A radiant game. Yeah, it's radiant. It just radiates. It has radiance. One might almost say. Let's pull our thoughts together and see if we can figure it out. Surely you're not talking about. No, it couldn't be that. It is. Pool of Radiance is also my number two. <laughs> not Pool of Radiance Return to Mythic. We Dr- had the same game. Yeah, as number two. Yeah, and we didn't know ahead of time going in. Uh, the, the only reason that this is not number one is because I have had a computer role-playing experience since then that was just the complete, I don't think I'll ever ever have a better one. Uh, but Pool of Radiance has to be number two just because it's an amazing game and the pure nostalgia of it. So I mm. still remember, you know, we both know Johnny Wood, game developer. Tyrant uh, Threx. Yeah, I remember walking in, and he's, I'm like, what is this game? I was at his house, he showed it to me, he's playing on Commodore 64, and I was like, wait a minute, you can play Dungeons & Dragons on a computer? 
And my head literally exploded. <laughs> and it's never quite come back together since then. So it's very important. I just 88, so I was like I 16. I wondered why your head looked like that. Yeah, well, that, it's been like that since I was 16. So Pool of Radiance, uh, fantastic game. I still love playing it. I'm a big crunchy tactical rules tabletop RPG player. So I love the turn-based crunchy tactical nature of the battles in um in pool of radiance so crunchy all right there's no song busters here none all right so your number your number one matt what's your number one uh, that would have to be the cesspool of radiance ruins of big Trail. that is the that is an amazing game to hate so <laughs> <laughs> no. Can I take a wild stab at what your number one might be? Uh, sure. Would it by guess. any chance be Baldur's Gate 2? Ah! You looked into the orb, didn't you? I looked into your book <laughs> where you rave for like 30 pages on oh, this you game. You did. Yeah. Yeah. I looked into your book, so I already knew what your number one was. Uh, oh yeah, Baldur's Gate too. Now that is a game there that does hold up perfectly well. It's 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 a it's a great game. My only again, and that's also a second AD and D second edition. No, I think Pool of Radiance might have been first edition AD and D adaptation. Uh, I'd have to go look, but uh, but this was the second edition AD and D ap- adaptation. Uh, again, my only gripe: uh, real time with pause combat. That's my only gripe on it. Ama- amazing game. So. I don't. I don't hold it as high in my personal list as a lot of people do, but it's a great game. Yeah, yeah. For me, Brent knows the way he described it was perfect. You know, it is. It, it, that game is for me is about the balance of the elements. It's a great experience. Not, no one element really stands out. I mean, talk story, characters, combat, game world. But I mean, it all works together really well. You know, it's the synthesis of all those elements. All right. It is a great game. I can't fault it. Uh, it's it's one of those games that even well, if you don't... Minsk it. It's got Minsk. Minsk. Go for the eyes. Boo. With his miniature giant space hamster. I'm pretty sure that's the origin of the gather. You must gather your party. You must, it is. You must gather your party before venturing forth. So, uh, fantastic game. Fantastic game. Uh, it's one of those games that... It, even if you're not into D and D or computer role playing games, a lot of people still played that and enjoyed it. So it was, it was done well. All right. So getting to my, just for the interest of time, getting my number one is uh, it, Legends. You, yeah, yeah, don't get me in trouble. I'm already in enough trouble with the Codex <laughs> over that one for not hating it. No, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, the original Kotor. Oh, in gosh, my yeah. in, in my in my opinion. Now, there's a lot of great role-playing games out there. In my opinion, that is the peak role-playing, computer role-playing game experience I've ever had. It it awesome hit game. smooth game, incredibly great adaptation of the D20 rule set. All the math was there under the hood if you wanted to look, but you didn't have to mess with it if you didn't want to. Story was great. Uh, I remember playing it and thinking, man, the story here and plotting is beating the pants off the prequels. You know, the big Darth Revan reveal, uh, the gameplay. I played it on PC. I played it on console. It, it, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's my peak role playing, computer role playing game experience. I don't think it'll ever be beat. I hope it will, but it hadn't been so far. So that is a great, great game. Great design, great writing. So almost up there with Super Bombad Racing. I don't almost know I... up there with Super Bombad oh. Racing. All right. So I'm joined by. Matt Barton here, my co-author. Or actually, I'm his co-author on Dungeons oh, & Desktop's yeah. second edition. Uh, and, and what we're doing here, you're going to notice a change in uh, the quality, actually, for the better for Matt. Because uh, during the radio show, because of last-minute Skype issues, he had to call in rather than participate by Skype. But what we wanted to do... Uh, yeah. <laughs> see, see how much... Yeah. I'll pile up the ball in the so um so anyway uh what what happened was with the radio version we like came down to like a minute left and we tried to real super quickly get through our biggest disappointments and we never even got a chance to get to our most anticipated Mm -hmm. so i reached out to the rat king himself and and said hey do you have some time to record record a little extra for the podcast version 
And, and lo and behold, he did. So here we are uh, via the magic of, of Google Hangouts recording some extra uh, for the podcast version. I appreciate that a lot, Matt. So uh, this man will do anything to sell a book. I will. By goodness and some good. <laughs> speaking of good news, the past few days, it looked like Amazon was having stock issues with the book. But now everything seems to be sorted out. So um, See, I attribute that to just all the fans just rushing out there. And just yeah, that's exactly that's what happened. Yeah, they they literally take uh, my money. They laid waste to three different Amazon regional warehouses, and so Amazon had to uh, quickly work with CRC Press to get more copies. Now, so, I wasn't aware that it had reached Australia yet. That, that's that's what amazes me. Well, yeah, I was uh, uh, one of the things we were talking about before we started recording. I, I got a an alert, uh, a Google alert or whatever that said new books from Shane Stacks, which was kind of weird. But yeah, you know that guy, yeah. Okay, so I clicked on it, and there was um, some Australian show or show some site, Australian site that said they had a copy. It was, was kind of like an Australian. Amazon or something. I can't remember the like, name of it. Good night, mate. Would you like yeah, a book? Yeah, would you like a book? And then uh, what I noticed was the sh- instead of... a giant knife. Yeah, yeah. You call that a knife? And uh, in fact, the entire website was just one huge knife. That's all it was. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but anyway, yeah, one thing I did notice that was instead of shopping cart, it was, the it said trolley. It said you have, you know, zero items. Trolley. Yeah, zero items in your trolley. Your trolley. Your trolley. So I guess they go to the the store and they put a shrimp in the trolley and they buy it. And then they take the shrimp home and throw it on the Barbie is, I guess, what happens. Wait, so you're telling me the thing I call a buggy. Yeah, they call it a trolley. My wife calls, I don't know what she calls it, like a shopping cart. I Something. Call well, I call it a cart, shopping cart. Yeah. You call it a cart? Cart, yep. And am I the only person that calls it a buggy? I grew up calling it a buggy. I remember calling it a buggy growing up. I heard people call it a basket. Basket, yep. I used to call it a basket. But I haven't ever heard trolley. That I'm pretty sure that's an Australian thing. An Australian yeah. thing. Yeah, let's throw it on the trolley. So, well, let's go to, I mean, I guess I'm I could go. use to, that today and be like, yep. Yeah, throw it in the trolley. So, all right. Put anyway, those books in the trolley. Put them in the trolley. Put them all in the trolley. Uh, buy all the books. So that's a little... Was that Mister Rogers' neighborhood? There was a trolley. There was a little trolley. That's that would, what I think about. That's it, a trolley. It would take you to Never Never Land. So yeah. Oh, I've got a little. Speaking of buying stuff, check this out. Hold on. Is it a trolley? Nope. Nope. <laughs> but was it ever inside a trolley? Because otherwise, a lot. No, of us. It, it wasn't. Uh, I probably. Hold oh. on. I probably just bumped the old microphone right there. Um, so, at my local game exchange which is a used uh, video game and uh, movie DVD Blu-ray type store. They're throughout the South. I don't know how far reaching they are, but uh, it's, it's, it's like a GameStop, but they don't have any new merchandise. It's all I got. Check this out. Whoa. Curse of the Azure bonds. Oh, and, that's what I just got kind of distracted there for a second when I saw that. Yeah, saw the uh, the cover art. <laughs> oh, the the lizard man. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, <laughs> Secret of the Silver Blades. Oh, that is a good. How much did you pay for those? It know? really wasn't much. It was like twenty dollars each, oh, and they've good. got all the stuff. Everything's in there. All the stuff. Is the clue book in there? Because that's the clue me. book. The clue book, the is, clue book is in there. That was a great deal. Then look at that. The clue books in oh, there. Oh yeah, good yeah. Stuff. And even I don't even want to play those without the clue. Look, book. look. It's got the. The data card, it's man, it's got everything, and then it's got um, it's got the adventurer's journal. Check this out. Check this out in Curse of the Azure Bonds. The only thing that could have made this better is if they would have had Pool of Radiance as well. Check this out. You ready? The code wheel. Oh yeah. Cool. Code. Wheel. And I mean, it's like literally you know, you the game. If you have the code wheel, I mean, yeah. That's really there exciting. you go. So. Yeah, and these things are in great shape. Um, that's an awesome find. I don't yeah. even think that code got, can you look me that code wheel doesn't even look like it's been used. Yeah, it's in great shape. It's all in great shape. So Man, see, I use mine so much a little divot thing in the middle yeah. came out. I had to improvise one. Yep. So anyway, I'm, I'm probably going to do a unboxing video on those two to help promote the book. So anyway, okay, we ended 
on, well, we had to rush through on the radio show our most antis- or biggest disappointments. We never got to the um, most anticipated. So I want to I want to give us the another future chance. disappointments. Yeah, the future. Yeah, and the future disappointments. So hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. What? So again, um, as if we've never talked about it, Matt. What was your biggest CRPG disappointment in the history of your CRPG playing? Oh, as if we haven't talked about this. Okay. Yep. Uh, well, that would be anticlimactically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Says pool of, of radiance. radiance ruins never has a game been more aptly named than that ruins of myth drain or okay so absolutely horrible what was so i've never played it i i, I all about all i know about it is everyone says it's terrible and that like in some cases it literally ate people's hard drives so what was yeah. so bad like no, what was so bad about this game? Me. I, I like to add that little bit it didn't happen right. to me i didn't realize i don't even remember bugs uh, i just remember it being uh so dreadful everything was just muddy looking it was a there was no excitement it was literally slow painfully slow that was the big thing i mean you get into a battle with five or six skeletons and it would just take like a better part of an hour it felt like just these things would you know each one would take its turn there'd be a pause (laughs) then it would like take a step pause take a step pause you know (laughs) like slowly come towards you and then it would go to the next skeleton in the same it, get, it was just agony playing this. And it was it was kind of drab. I hear I mean, you just could not believe this thing made it through any kind of playtesting whatsoever. Extremely drab. Who ma- I can't remember off the top of my head who made it. Who made this game? Uh, uh, I think that was uh, I think it was a one off. I'm looking it up. I don't know what happened. I, I, I've never heard anything good about this game. So it, it 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 really must be terrible. Uh, it's by well, it was released by Ubisoft, but they may have just been the publisher. I don't know. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, the, the Stormfront Stormfront Studios is the one oh, are the ones that developed it. Big low. That, that, that should have been. Yeah, it must have been a rush job or something. Because isn't the, aren't those the guys that made some of the latter gold box games like the. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, Savage, what is it called? Treasures of the Savage Frontier. Let's look it up. Um, I knew that one. Let's look up their games developed. I'm uh, if only there were an interconnected series of computers <laughs> and networks that we could consult. Um, let's see. Well, they've got a lot of uh, experience making uh, racing games for some strange reason. Oh, the, you know what? They they developed the original Neverwinter Nights on AOL. Oh, that's where that... Yeah, wow. it is Don Daglow's company. Yeah, wow. Um, I thought they did a... Yeah, they did some gold box. They did the Savage Gateway to the Savage Frontier. Yeah. And Treasure of the Savage... Which, both of those are in my... They kind of come late in the game. What is that? Early 90s for those? But yeah, I thought 91. Both of those games were great. I had a great time with those. So, but the I mean, thing was... Had no excuse for this. Well, they were, but with those, they were using an existing mature engine, right? I mean, I'm assuming that Ruins of Myth Draenor used their own uh, uh, engine. Like, it was a new engine, right? Yeah, I don't even see it. This game mentioned on their wiki page. Wow. Yeah. I, That's I, how I, bad it is. They don't even mention it. I know that it, it, uh, it receives um, universal scorn. You know, and I wonder, do you think that if it hadn't had the Pool of Radiance name on it, people would have hated it as much? Like, No, oh, that's why. That's exactly why I hate it. Otherwise, it would have just been like, eh, this game is kind right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, but yeah, the fact that it was, the expectations set with that. Yeah. And it had been several, when did this come out? 2000. Came out 2001, yeah. It's been almost a decade since we had a gold box game. I remember holding it in my hand at like Hastings or something um, and like putting it back down, like almost buying it, but putting it back down for some reason. Uh, maybe fate was intervening on my behalf. Um, and <laughs> I've this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, and then, you know, and then later, you know, everyone just savaged it, so... Yeah, I got. I wanted to say I came across it in Sam's Club. 
yeah. of all places. And I, I picked it up and I, I, I was like, wow, this is Pool of Radiance? Really? Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was kind of shocked that the price was, I, I wanted to say it was like 20 bucks. It was Pool of Pool of succulents, succulents. Well, I'm thinking, how could this possibly be twenty bucks already? But my goodness, this is the company that did Madden NFL '98. How could they possibly go wrong? Yeah, with... here's some comments from Wikipedia. This is GameSpy. Yeah. Quote: yeah. If you see this game, walk away really fast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's see. Do they see why they didn't like it? Oh, there's Johnny Wilson. Yeah, a dragon. I like the way this new edition of the D and D rules have been integrated into the game. So I guess he liked it. Wow. Well, the one thing that rushed I, out the door despite being a, over a year late. Well, it looks battles. Now I've got yeah. to play it just to because I like bad movies. It might not be as bad as I remember. Now I got to play it just because like I like bad movies, but some movies are so bad they're not even entertaining bad. Right. So I wonder if yeah. Ruins of Myth Duran or or myth drano down a shark myth, NATO or yeah a... myth down the drain well shark nato <laughs> knew what it was right yeah, they I, knew I, I they were that's making one of those ba- as bad was good kind of movies. right well they Anaconda's said uh, there's another one i put in that yeah you know and and even some movies that are supposed to be good but are bad can still be entertaining on a certain level like you know mystery science theater 3000 but oh, yeah. some crap is so bad there's no redeeming surf not surf Nazis must die. Well, now there's some people out there that love surf Nazis must I die. Like it. So, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I'm one of so, those people. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, now they did have a collector's edition of the game. Uh, you got a copy of the book. Uh, I don't know what book they're talking about. The book? Yeah. A copy of the book, an original pen and paper module, an audio CD and a bag of polyhedral dice. The printed adventure was called pool of radiance attack on myth trainer. So I guess this this game could have been called Pool of, Attack on Pool of Radiance. Yeah, look at these designers. I've never heard of any of these guys. Yeah. I don't know if they ever went on to You know, it could have been a lot. You know, nobody sets out to make a crap game, right? And nobody sets out to take one of the most beloved uh CRPGs of all time and and to mess it up, you know. So hopefully they didn't uh Oh, now this is uh is this used the? It can't. It doesn't use the Infinity Engine, does it? It says unlike Baldur's yeah. Gate and other it's Infinity. It's got turn based. Oh, it's got. Well, now see, that's one redeeming value. It's got turn based com, combat. Yeah, but it's one of those games that gives turn based a bad name because you know when people think about turn based, they yeah. think about some dreck like this and think it sucks. One of my favorite implementations of turn based is. Uh, other than like the gold box games, which I think do a wonderful job with turn-based combat, uh, is uh, oh darn it, Temple of Elemental Evil. Yeah. Uh, now that game, out of the box, has a lot of problems, but the uh, Circle of Eight mod, if you've ever used that, really fixes a lot of bugs and makes it a, a pretty spectacular game. Uh, and you know Troika, who made. Uh, Temple of the Elemental Evil, they, what they did is they tried to put in everything from the rules, and they had so much math to deal with that they just ended up with a metric poopy ton of bugs. Because there's a lot, if you try to cover every possible scenario and every possible rule and combat rule in D&D, that's a lot of programming, a lot of math. I don't think people realize that. But anyway, all right. Um, Okay, so ruins of of the myth going down the drain is is <laughs> is your biggest disappointment. Um, I won't know. say though. I think you're onto something with it. Yeah. It's probably more owing to the title, yeah, than the actual game. You know, it's more about the expectations because I could probably play the game and be like, you know, this is stinky, but it's not right. I mean, I'm sure there have been many worse. Right. ERPGs, mutants, was it mutants of the scavenger world or something? Some, scavengers yeah. of the mutant world. I mean, <laughs> right. I'm sure that's worse than this. But still. Well, I've rarely played a terrible CRPG, but I have played those that were a disappointment for one reason or the other. Before Descent to Under Mountains, another one that gets is that a big is personally. that a big stinker? Yeah. So um, another thing that Ruins of Mitranner Ruins of Mitranner had to deal with was. Uh, it looks like they converted from AD and D second edition to AD and D third edition mid development, which is a pretty oh, big deal. Yeah. So that might've, 
that might have had something to do. Yeah, it was originally designed using second edition, but it was converted to third edition part way through development. So yeah, you don't want to change horses midstream. Yeah. So yeah. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I also heard some of the art design was very lackluster. Like the dungeon tiles all look the same or something. Let's see. Did they have some screenshots? Yeah, just looking at these screenshots it looks okay, but yeah, I may have to do a let's play of it just to MST three K it. I don't know. I pretty much blocked it out of memory. So, <laughs> well, the above ground looks okay. I don't know. The graphic style is very similar to Baldur's Gate. Very similar. Yeah. In fact, if yeah, you, maybe if you the, <laughs> other than the isometric viewpoint. Yeah, if you didn't know better, just on first glance, you might think it was a, a Baldur's Gate, especially the above ground stuff. So, I don't know, but yeah, I haven't heard I haven't heard much much good about Pool of Radiance, Ruins of Myth Drainer. All right, so uh, moving on, you can you can pretend to be surprised because we've already talked about this, but we're re-recording it. Uh, my biggest disappointment. Um, and it would have, it probably would have been Temple of Elemental Evil, except for that that Circle of Eight mod is is really really impressive. Um, if people have never tried that out, it it fixes a lot of stuff and even adds new content in some ways. I might have gone with that uh, because I was really anticipating that when when Troika was you know talking about all the all the stuff it would do and all the rules it would implement, uh, and even. In its broken state, I give it a lot of credit. I love that radial uh, menu style where you like yeah. click on a character and you get that it continues to unfold radial to let you dig deeper into the combat options. Uh, but uh, have, my biggest disappointment is is got to be Fable because this was back in the days before I learned to take developer interviews and press and hype with a grain of salt. And I believed everything was it. Is it Peter, Peter Molyneux? Molyneux? Yeah. How do you say? I believed everything they told me. Uh, this was what in the early two thousands, uh, mid two thousands. It was one of the great big console art. Well, it was going to be on Xbox because yeah. Xbox had a hard drive and they needed a hard drive to keep up with all. Dude, I was so I was like, they're like, you're going to actually uh, go from being a little boy, and you'll go through your teenage years and then you'll be in and everything you do has a consequence and you know like you said the other day like you plant an acorn you come back later you'll see the tree and all of i was like wow i was so blown away get and, married have kids yeah all of this stuff and and what it ended up doing once they finally shipped it is you played for what like an hour as the little boy and then all of a sudden it was like doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, and suddenly you're the adult and all of these choices they said were going to come into play didn't. And so I, I was just very disappointed. Not that Fable, Fable was a good game and, and a lot of people love it. Compared to what was promised, it's a huge disappointment to me. So I'm still disappointed. You know, I, I do think. Alone, I, I came across many reviews of the game along those lines. And yeah, I think the people that like me, I hadn't read anything about it when I played Right, right. And I was just like, what? It's a fine game. Right. Yeah, no, it was, I was like, wow, we're like on the edge of a whole new era of games, right? Uh, but, but, but anyway, uh, I do think that we're, we're getting close to having the technology and resources and computational power and, and all that now to, 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 to do a game like that, you know, where, you you can do that. You know, could you imagine an like a personal MMO that you play yourself off and on for like 20 or 30 years? I can see it happening now, right? It doesn't even have to be a multiplayer, but it's an MMO style game where, you know, you just play it constantly. You just get older. Yeah, years and years and years and years. That would I be kind it. of interesting, like with the World of Warcraft, if your yeah. character's aged along yeah. with you. And <laughs> That'd be pretty neat. So... I don't yeah. know what kind of effect they would want to have on. You'd be you'd be out there, where you're, you're like eighty, and your character's like, "Get off my lawn!" and he's swinging his sword around and everything. And big, you got some troll in big black socks yeah. telling people to get off their lawn. So well, there are games uh, like the Gold Box games that you could age, right? 
And I guess Fable too. I, I mean, Fable. How did they? How did they handle that in that game? They you get old enough to die. Off I honestly thing? can't remember. I don't think so. Um, if if you do, it jumps right. So what was originally supposed to happen? It was this, this is going to be natural progression. Uh, and, and instead, you know, you you leapt forward, sort of, you know, instantly yeah. uh, with through like a cutscene or something. So <laughs> that's you must have been like, that's it. Yeah, I was. <laughs> You know, I, I was like, you got to be kidding. Because I was like, I, I was getting all excited. Another game that you talked to, um, oh, is it Brent Knowles? Who did you just talk to that was such yeah, a fan? Yeah, from, Bo- Bioware. from Bioware and all that. Another game that I was really excited for that didn't hit as big as I thought it would was, uh, oh, what's their martial arts? Uh, uh, oh, Jade Empire. Jade Empire. I was pretty excited for that. I played uh, all the way through that one. Yeah. Yeah. I came off of Knights of the Old Republic looking forward to that one pretty hard. When I got done with Knights of the Old Republic, Bioware could do no wrong. You know, I was like, they, they, they could do no wrong. And and for several years, they were on a pretty big, you know, pretty big hit, you know, or uh, what do you call it? A roll. They were, they were, yeah. they were, they were, they were putting the hits out. So, all right. So that was my big dis- disappointment. I think their problem with the. I think what happened, they got tired of paying the royalties. Yep, that's exactly what happened. The same thing with the uh, Mass Effect, right? Yep. And what was the other game uh, when they started doing the Dragon Age? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you can, I mean, developing your own IP uh, is sort of the holy grail of that kind of thing. Because yeah, if you not only do you not have to pay somebody else royalties... But then you get all the money when people want to merchandise the, you yeah. know, the uh, Dragon Age underoos or or whatever, <laughs> you know. So you got the Mass Effect stuff back there. Yeah, and also exactly. the control. You don't. I mean, they got total control over, it, right? So they don't have to right. deal with any uh, right lore masters or anything over. But but just as a player, though, I much prefer. Yeah, you know, I'd be much happier like if they had just continued licensing Star Wars. I would yeah, be making Knights of the Old Republic games. And yeah, me too. You know, um, that was another disappointment where I'm not really getting the MMOs. Uh, I, I kind of consider MMOs a different thing than CRPGs uh, on, a, on, on a certain level. But I was pretty disappointed with uh, the Old Republic MMO when it first came out, only because up to that point, BioWare had been like, practically miracle workers in my opinion with these amazing games they were putting out so i expected them to completely break the mold in mmos and they really didn't they delivered basically an everquest uh or world of warcraft experience with basically all of the dialogue was spoken that was really the only difference you know uh now later on they kept patching it to where the this the single player experience got stronger and stronger, but that was kind of a letdown for me. You know, I was expecting them to completely redefine what an MMO could be, you know, victims of their own success. So. Yeah. Everybody was saying, this will be the wow killer. I I was, all the star Wars galaxy guys are kind of upset about it. As I recall, it's been, I guess that's been a few years since that came out. When uh, old Republic came out in, Five or six years ago now, I think. Maybe longer. I can't remember. Every now and then I'll run into somebody who's still kind of crazy about it. But Yeah. Well, it's a nice game. It just I you know, I wanted I wanted the Knights of the Old Republic of MMOs. Well, I wanted to be blown. Yeah, that Star Wars tabletop RPG is huge. You know? Yeah. What what's the excuse? I mean, they should have a you know, kick ass mm. yeah. MMO based on that. I think I think just developing an MMO is that is an engaging, satisfying experience is harder than a lot of people think. Yeah, you know, what, can, what I heard with the with that game was they tried too hard to make it some kind of hybrid of a single player and an MMO, and they kind of just didn't get either one. Right. It's like the game didn't know what it wanted to be, kind of a deal. Well, I mean, I started playing it, and and I'm expecting a revolutionary experience, and within a couple of hours, they're like, "Okay, go find a group and quest and grind and level up," and I'm like. Right. You know, I, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, it looks yeah, nice. Expectations were high after yeah. all the cutscenes and some yeah. cinematics and everything. Yeah, you know, so like I said, again, victims of their own success, like, 
you know, oh, well, it's Bioware, so it, it's got to be different. And it wasn't really. So, uh, I okay. Playing that. I think I played that for maybe a couple of days. And like the first few hours, I was just so amazed. I'm like, this is yeah. it. Yeah. This is going to be, this is going to be, a, this is, this, you know, this is, this is the thing. Right. <laughs> and then like the next day coming back, it just felt like, Phew. Yeah, it's, you know, okay. once you once you get over being impressed by the fact that everything is so polished and everything is voice acted, you're like, this is just a regular MMO. There's nothing else here, you know, and uh, I you know, bear asses. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> collect 12 bear. Yeah, asses. collect whatever, you know, and, you know, I was like, OK. And, you know, and uh you know, it kind of comes back to that conversation you have with Brent Knowles, which again, that was such a great interview where he's like, if you want everything spoken, you get 50% less choice, right? Because it's That's so right. much harder to have all these voice actors speak everything. And I'm one of those people that I'd rather have nothing spoken and give me a richer story with more choice and this and that and the other than everything spoken. Right. I mean, I'll go watch a movie if I want everything spoken. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, but maybe newer gamers aren't like that. You know, they expect everything to be. Oh, yeah. They're you know, watching that. What's that D&D &D show? Everybody's always. Talking yeah. Critical about. role. Critical yeah. role. I mean, that's what yeah. they're expecting everything to be like. now. Right. Yeah. Which I'm like, you know, I'm the I'm the old grumpy critical role. Blah, whatever. Bunch of hipsters. Give me, give me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was yeah. into this before it was cool. Yeah, these guys these, when they weren't even born yet, and I was rolling dice. So um, <laughs> we had D sixes back in my yeah, day. Yeah, we liked like, it. Yeah, we liked it. So uh, <laughs> did we? Like, did we? Did, did we? Like we didn't it? even have D sixes. <laughs> we we found stuff and rolled it. We we got chairs and whichever side the chair flipped up on was what happened. Uh, anyway, okay, so most anticipated. What Matt, what is your most anticipated yeah, is, well, CRPG? You know, for those who haven't gotten the book yet, which sounds like the majority of humanity at this moment. Yeah. Uh, Shane has a chapter in here. He actually did this section or chat. I guess it's a, well, this is a section within the chapter called CRPG, CRPGs Under Development. Right. Is what I was looking at. And he's got... Let's see what some of these have actually come out already. Right, shows you how long it takes to book. Yeah, to come it shows out you it does. It does. Yeah, that yeah. uh, I mean they haven't been out for a long time. Adam RPG is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, that's a great. That probably might have made my most anticipated if it wasn't already out. That's a yeah. that if people don't know, that's basically the Soviet Fallout, and it's yeah, a Russian. really wonderful game. Yeah, yeah, Russian Fall. It's made by Russian developers, and and the conceit is basically Fallout in the Soviet Union. Like the what what would have happened if Fallout had been told from the perspective of the Soviet Union. And you should definitely check that out, especially if you're the yeah. type that's really turned off by the uh, Obsidian's Fallout games and Yep. You know, if you don't like that, if you want something more old school You mean Bethesda? Or Bethesda is what yeah. they, what did I say? Yep. <laughs> well Obsidian <laughs> does like take a lot of properties. Isometric yeah. view and everything of Fallout one and two. And there's also a wonderful experience you learn, you see things from like the Russian experience, you know, perspective, yeah. the, a lot of the stuff they put in there. It's, it's a wonderful game. Yeah. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Even if you don't like fallout, just, yeah, you're going to be impressed with that. But anyway, onto the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, now the new anticipated, I'm actually most anticipating wasteland three. And I really like Shane's, uh, you're talking about you in third person. even though Sure. You're here. Yep. <laughs> I really like uh, Shane's uh, description of this. Because he focuses it, he focuses in on the what I think is also, you know, this could make or break the game. Basically, right. I don't know anything else about it other than what is known here. But he says that it's going to have this multiplayer. It's going to have a bold new CRPG multiplayer experience, and this is the quote: "Up to two players can each field a unique team of rangers. When those teams are close together in the game, they'll be able to take part in the same turn-based skirmishes. But when they're apart," Each player will have their own chance to move the campaign story forward. And I think this is the coolest idea. At times, leading to a cascade of unintended consequences for the other player. Now, this that sounds awesome. If they can pull it off. That's that's a big if. Because the game ain't out yet. 
But I you mean, know, just imagine that. I mean, no, the, the mind yeah. just right blows my mind just thinking about the possibilities of something like this. So, yeah, you know, I guess uh, you know I could go off and and find be fighting some rats in a dungeon somewhere. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's. Uh, I, I mean, you know, obviously it's Brian Fargo. It's in exile. Mm-hmm. The pedigree is strong, um, and it's you know if they can pull that off. It you know it's going to be pretty amazing. So. Well, that's one of the things I've you know we've been talking behind the scenes about doing a game, co-oping a game, and that's one of the issues as well. You know, you kind of both have to be online at the same time, right? Uh, you don't want somebody to get a lot further along than you, right? Right. I mean, there's a lot of issues around that. So this sounds like it would be a really interesting Mix. alternative if they can pull it off. Like if you could play it for a while, then I could play it some. Yeah, if, if you could play it like when you want to, yeah, when then, I want to, and then the other person's the playing that it when I they want, want to, to as well. And then if you both happen to be online and near each other, you know, and then have this game world responding to these right. two different players. I mean, that's the thing that. Yeah, I, I love the idea of like Matt logging on, playing like I'm not even anywhere around. He plays for a while, and then something he does impacts my experience three days later. Uh, and then on top of that, if we both happen to be online and our in-game squad of ranges are near each other, all of a sudden they can hook up and be in the same combat. So that's that's pretty crazy yeah, that'd be stuff. Pretty neat. Just, hey Shane, I'm yeah. having real trouble with these uh, leather punks. Yeah, that'd be really <laughs> cool. Hop on and yeah, <laughs> bring your rangers over. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, so um, maybe we can go on a quest together uh, to get. Uh, to bring Ace's bones home for their uh, resting place, to give Ace his send off, his his true send off, and because Ace is the guy at the beginning of Wasteland Two that has blown it right, and you've got to go out and and pick up where he left off. What so, a guy! What a guy! Good old Ace. So, <laughs> what did you say in the book that the game the game kicked his ace or something like that? So, <laughs> oh, probably. <something. laughs> yeah, it's fun. I've got like I think we said earlier during the show, but I've gotten a lot of good feedback on those, that little Abbott and Costello routine. So, um, which like I said, I didn't know how that was going to come off, but I think it came off well. There's uh, for people who haven't seen the book yet, several places in the book. There's these little sort of who's on first routines that that Matt and I go through while we're talking about a, a game or a subject that are sort of almost like little sidebars apart from the main. Content. Yeah, these are really. I don't want to spoil them. Yeah. But yeah, there's. I think you'll get a couple of chuckles out of it. Yeah, they're fun. Yeah, very geeky. Just, just, just yeah. the nerdiness level. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, as you said earlier during the radio version of the show, uh, I, you know, in addition to the fact that the book's been updated, it's got new content. There's corrections, revisions. The screenshots look amazing. Uh, the book has more personality than than you know. We we injected some personality into it that. Uh, as far as almost tongue in cheek kind of fourth wall breaking stuff. So, yeah, these, these still kind of make me smile. Yeah, they're fun. I think I'll just read one just to give you. Hey, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, like he says, they're, they're kind of set up like uh, Abbott and Costello. So, there's Shane Colin and then a Matt Colin. <laughs> so, here's what, yeah. here's what Shane says Didn't you say that if enough people bought this book, <laughs> we wouldn't starve to death? Matt, actually. I said, I <laughs> wouldn't starve to death. And I think if I remember right there, we're play- of, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Actually, that's, I said, that's responding to something we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And there, there's something in the book at that point. I think we're talking about uh, Ultima. I think. Or, yeah. It's Ultima wizardry or one of them where you have to eat in the game to stay yeah. alive. Yeah. And I, and I, and so that came popping out. All right. So, your most anticipated is Wasteland 3 because you're really intrigued by that multiplayer uh, component, which I hope they pull off, but I'll believe it when I see it. You know, um, I learned from fable, Matt, I learned, (laughs) um, my, my most anticipated, uh, almost was copper dreams from, uh, uh, well, not well, not studios. That was definitely, that's, that's definitely on my list. It's, it's definitely on my top three. Not only does it look great, it looks like it's got some innovative yeah. gameplay. It's a cyberpunk CRPG. Uh, but I was incredibly impressed by Serpent and Staglands. And, 
you know, I've got a lot of respect for uh, Joe and Joe Hannah. Joe and Hannah, which fantastic. Yeah. Just people in general. Yeah, they're I'm not. A, I'm a fan of them. <laughs> yeah, me too. They're like, they're, you know, I love talking to them. Yeah. Another runner up is, uh, it's Shy Snake Games. I can't, it's not my most anticipated. Shy oh, it's Snake. Super Mega Bombad Racing. Yeah, it's got to be Star Wars Super Mega and Bombad Racing. Shy Snake Games. I'm another game, though. Wow. I've seen like a. Yeah, hold on. Is that your most anticipated? That, that's not, that's not it. This is another runner up. Spy DNA. That's another uh, CRPG I'm looking forward to. That It's another husband and wife development team. I did a show with them quite a while back, but just the amount of detail on the weapons and ballistics and everything they're going into are, are, is just out of control. But my most anticipated game, and I didn't even know about the CRPG when I was writing the book, is called Knights of the Chalice 2. Now, this is, it, it kind of looks like a retro uh, isometric RPG experience. It's it's an indie developer. It's like one guy. Uh, the name of the the, the company is... Uh, yeah, Knights of the Chalice. Well, that sounds familiar. Yeah, there's Heroic Fantasy Games is the developer. I think it's just one guy. And I, I missed Knights of the Chalice, Knights of the Chalice one, uh, but there's a demo. But the reason that I'm really excited about Knights of the Chalice two is it's an indie game. Uh, I like to support indies, but it's an epic, high magic, heroic fantasy party based top down. Oh, so it's not an isometric. It's two, uh, top down, two dimensional CRPG. Uh, focusing on epic, challenging, turn-based combat and captivating story, uh, offering a variety of real options and in-game consequences. But what really excites me about this is uh, they are implementing uh, the D&D Open Gaming License 3.5 rule set. So, huh. uh, you know, being both a D&D nerd and a, uh, a computer role-playing game nerd, uh, the, I, I'm very excited about this. What I've seen of Knights of the Chalice one and also the, um, screenshots and demo or not demos, but videos or whatever of night into there's a trailer out there. I'm just really excited about this. I want to check it out. So it, game, I don't even see it available for, it's not out yet. Not on steam or GOG. The first one. Yeah. You have to buy it straight from Helm. I think, um, I do see that the first one got game Banshee's game of the year. Yep. Award yeah, 2009. 2009. I completely missed this one. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, in fact, the only reason I think I know anything about it is we have a mutual friend on Facebook that I think he approached both of us and said, hey, this guy I know is making this game. Y'all want to talk to him? The mutual Facebook friend is actually Robbie Sambot, the cover artist for our new book. A wonderful cover. Anyway, uh, Robbie has done some music or audio, maybe both for Knights of the Chalice 2, and reached out uh, to see if I would like to interview the developer whose name is Pierre. So hopefully something will work out along those lines, whether it's a, a radio show or a blog post or, or whatever. Regardless, I'm very interested in the game. And so I started looking at it, and... Uh, you know, I was going to like these early Ultimas. Yeah, like that's early, early ones. Yeah, this is a, it's kind of like playing an old Ultima or an old Might and Magic or something like that. But with the D&D 3.5 rule set and that that's kind of that. exciting me. Yeah. So so and I was I offered to have the developer on the show, but evidently he's more open to like uh, like email type interviews or something like that. So I may work up a blog post or okay. something talking to this guy. So, you know, you were talking about um, uh, in, in a lot of your interviews, you talk uh, with developers is like, how, why can't we get games today that scratch that itch? Yeah. And I feel like this has the possibility of scratching that itch. I think I'll have to review the first one. Yeah. Maybe I you can do a retro. Of, I think that's worthy of a match yet. Yeah. Is the same when the new one's coming out? Or do you know? Uh, I think it's supposed to be pretty soon. I get email updates on it every now and then. Well, yeah. another thing, and uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say about uh, Knights of the Chalice 2 is on the website at heroicfantasygames.com, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a section that says what it is not. Okay. Uh, 
And it, and it says, uh, it's not designed with the intent to offer a huge nonlinear open world for the player to explore. Sometimes games with a huge open world make the player feel like a rudderless ship lost in the ocean without guidance. Instead, this game focuses on a highly enjoyable core gameplay based on the rules of uh, the OGL 3.5 and an excellent story. I don't now, and I never have minded a linear story as long as it's enjoyable. Not every game has to have 300 hours of gameplay and, you know, moral ambiguity and all that, you know, just <laughs> meaningful choices. And, uh, and, and I'm not against meaningful choices, depending oh, yeah, on every, what kind. You know, yeah. I feel like they're just trying to copy that Grand Theft Auto 3 formula. I mean, I've, I've played enough Grand Theft Auto 3. Right. I well, don't need to play it again. And, and there's a place for those kind of games because people enjoy those kind of games. But so, like like Shadowrun uh, Returns, right? I enjoyed the first one more than because it was just a linear fun game. Uh, and then the second one, they added all the companions that I've got to learn their story, like a blossoming flower and all this stuff. And I, I don't necessarily dislike that depending on the game. Like Knights of the Old Republic... I love talking to all the companions, you know, if it's done yeah. well. Uh, you really but, want to dig deep into a game like that. They don't have to prod you. Right. Uh, and, and you know, depending on if it's done right and the kind of experience I'm in the mood for. But I'm also like, sometimes just give me a good old-fashioned, you're the good guy, they're the bad guy, go get them. And, you know, level up until you can beat them, right? I yeah. mean, I'm fine with that. So, uh, so that Knights of the Chalice too. Now is my pick. Now I have to say, I'm That's surprised. A really good pick. I'm actually really impressed with your pick. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's got, I mean, I, I like that you're kind of shining the spotlight on this guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we know it's a guy or I, I think so. Yeah. Oh, Cause <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've got his email and this I think, man here. yeah, I think I've emailed, I'd have to go dig. But, uh, if I would have known about this game before we finished the book, I definitely would have, put that in the upcoming oh stellar tactics is another one yeah that guy's rob is it rob wilkins yeah i like wilkins don wilkins that's it that guy's a cool guy yeah i mean that 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 has but definitely has potential that's a labor of love but he's also got talent so if i would have known about knights of the chalice i definitely would have you know given a big shout out to this game because it looks really cool all right man well that was that was basically what i wanted to do is you know kind of expand on uh, you know, that we didn't get a chance to get into in the radio show. Did you have any other notes or thoughts or anything you wanted to add in general before we draw this uh, Google Hangout to a, to a close? I can't really think of anything. You kind of got me. <laughs> You're all in the night. Of the of this night of the <laughs> thing. It looks like they're. What is going on with these? screenshots i can't tell what i'm looking at here okay close that off yeah <laughs> yeah we're definitely gonna have to look more into that okay oh uh, no i can't really think of too much more i mean i'm really excited for people to get get the book and hopefully get some reviews up on amazon right a lot of people don't realize you know how important that is and yeah if you get a copy of the book please review it on amazon That's yeah please do yeah. you know you might think it doesn't make any difference or even if you're not like you know, foaming at the mouth about how great the book is. <laughs> right. Uh, a lot of, the, a lot of times just the quantity. Yep. Just having inner, having reviews, read the book. You know, was okay. <laughs> yeah. It was all right. Whatever. You know, uh, any feedback that is offered genuinely yeah. and, and not as a jack hole is appreciated. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the things we did in this book was we'll go back and look at all the reviews. Right. What did people, you know, what did people like, what do they not like? And Right. Anyway, yeah, so that's Dungeons and Desktop Second Edition, the the history of computer role playing games, Second Edition, I should say. And um, again, Matt, uh, you know, I, I appreciate it. it. was It was a lot of fun to come along for the ride, and painful but fun. So you were like, "You sure want to do this? It's a lot of work." I'm like, "Whatever." And like a year later, I'm like laid out, almost in a coma. Oh God, not another yeah. round of proofs. People out there, get if you're into this at all, if you're into retro gaming, if you're into computer or game history at all, uh, but definitely if you're into computer role playing games, uh, I think I think that this you'll like this book. All right, well I got to get us out of here, folks. Don't forget. Dungeons and Desktops, History of Computer Role-Playing Game, Matt Barton and myself as co-author. You can get it on Amazon. 
Uh, it's a, it's a, it really is a, an amazing book. I, I was blown People away. Love this book. Yeah, I was blown away. I got to do the bad joke of the week. Uh, I once held the door for a bard. I guess you could say it was a nice jester. Are you getting it? Yeah. All right. Anyway, folks, we'll catch you next time. Dungeons and Desktop, second edition. All right, Matt. Thank you very much, sir. Go kill some rats, pal. Are you interested in the party? Yes! You must gather your party. Gather your party. You must gather your party. Shame Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash shameplays.